All right. So today we talked about the electrical storm. And uh, Dr. Edafe Emmanuel, consultant international cardiologist um, with UPTH and with Cardio Care, will be taking us through some of the slides. Um, of note, it's a case we managed in Cardio Care recently. Um, um, myself and Dr. Edafe managed a very challenging case. Um, and uh, we thought, thought it wise to talk about this. Um, perhaps. I don't know about Dr. Edafe, but I've not seen any such case in Nigeria since I've been practicing for a while now. So it's a very important topic so that everybody can get themselves acquainted with it and uh, yes. you know, and then make it so. So Dr. Edafe needs no introduction in this group. Um, Dr. Edafe is an astute physician and a fantastic all-round guy. As an all-round good guy, let me say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Edafe, over to you. Uh, Dr. Zeko, thank you for the kind words. So today we uh, want to thank again uh, Peace for Life and all the good guys, uh, AJ, Julius, Jared, for the fantastic work everybody's doing. We are going to take electrical storm today. So this is the outline. We just introduced briefly. We talk about uh, case presentation, uh, just as Dr. Zeko said. Um, we managed one case uh, recently, then there were two cases. I also saw one 2018, one 2019. I will just talk about them briefly as, as they, are, they are really challenging. Then look at the discussion of the cases, then we conclude. Uh, there is no conflict of interest to be made known in this uh, presentation. So electrical storm referred to uh, multiple uh, recurrences of ventricular arrhythmia over a short period of time. In most instances, the, uh, the arrhythmia is ventricular tachycardia, but it can also be uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or uh, ventricular fibrillation uh, that can result into electrical storm. So electrical, uh, the, the arrhythmia can be self-terminated, but frequently they are, they are to either be terminated by either antiarrhythmic medication or by reasons of defibrillation or anti tachycardia pacing. In contrast to repetitive ventricular arrhythmias occurring in ventricular storm, incident, uh, 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 incident ventricular uh, tachycardia is defined as the hem hemodynamically stable a VT which uh, uh, persists longer than an hour. So the summary here is that the first case is a 56-year-old uh, lady uh, who, uh, sorry for that, who has been living uh, with diabetes for about 10 years, hypertension and dyslipidemia, about three years. She presented to a facility at the cardiac care multi-specialty hospital with shortness of breath, chest pain, the pressure at the emergency was unrecordably low, and this is the, uh, the EKG at records. So obviously, the patient was having sinus rhythm and deteriorated straight into uh, ventricular uh, tachycardia. And this is uh, with hemodynamically unstable. So the first thing that was done was that he was actually cardioverted with the defibrillator. Then she was given IV amiodarone. And um, what we did was that we planned this patient for an ICD. So on the day of the ICD, wow, we enter into a real time in the cat lab. So these are the various shock on the day of the ICD. What did we notice on the day of the ICD? We have our puncture, very fantastic. I want, it went on very well. There's no issue with the puncture. Then to get our ventricular lead into the right ventricle, oh my God, it was a hell to do that. Dr. Seko has to um, uh, on scrub uh, to go and mount the, uh, uh, to direct the, um, uh, the advanced life support uh, protocol because immediately the, the lead was, the lead advanced into the, uh, uh, into the right ventricle and as she touches any part of the right ventricle, there is a VT that is generated. We use all the doses of uh, medication available to us, especially amiodarone. We preloaded with uh, IV amiodarone, also continue with the oral amiodarone, yet we're having it. Uh, we shocked this patient multiple times, almost eight times during 
uh, during the ICD uh, implantation that took roughly less than an hour. So we shocked this patient almost that eight time because she, anytime the lead goes in, she goes into a VF, it goes into a VF, sorry, a VT, and we go, we chalk and it return back, we chalk and it return back, but we successfully positioned the lead. And uh, after positioning the lead, uh, we went into positioning of the atrial lead and we closed back. And uh, then after that, the next thing is to look for, uh, to do an angiogram. We did an angiogram for the patient and found out that even though she's diabetic for that number of years, the coronary arteries were all perfectly uh, normal. So what is this? This is non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. That is what she has. And um, the ICD was in place. We move out uh, straight to the ICU. Uh, in the ICU, we are getting some of this, uh, uh, so, yeah, some of this uh, report in the ICU have not sustained VT why even on the medications? So after is she spent another uh, uh, another four to five days in the uh, in the hospital before we finally discharge her and finally finally she's coming to see us in the outpatient clinic and she's doing very well. So we discharge her own on the um, amiodarone, on uh, optimal dose of amiodarone and also bisoprolol and continue uh, on that. So the second patient is uh, a, a happened to uh, 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 this case happened in uh, 2019. Uh, she a woman she had the Saint Jude uh, ICD planted outside Nigeria, specifically in London. She returned home and uh, why about 8 p.m. in the evening she started having multiple shock from the ICD, and um, she was. Uh, she was rushed to the uh, to the nearby hospital, and several is, uh, EKG done showed that she had ventricular tachycardia, uh, uh, sustained ventricular tachycardia from the ICD. So that was around 8 p.m. And the city where she is from, where I live, uh, from Portaco, you have to take almost four hours to transit. So the plan was that she they would they would move her as early in the morning because it's already late in the night and the, uh, the ambulance driver was not ready to take a risky movement uh, through, uh, if that would last him for almost four hours in the night. So, but a fortunate thing happened. Uh, she had almost 35 uh, shock between that eight and uh, 2 p.m. and I was awake with the cardiologist. We gave, uh, we, I started to give all manner of medications and we did, or uh, even to the point of going to the things that are not even recommended of giving um, uh, giving um, uh, magnesium sulfate after we exhausted amiodarone, exhausted every other thing, yet the, 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 the shock continued and the battery was drained out and the arrhythmia still continued. As at 2 p.m., the lady still, have, uh, still continue having this recurrent arrhythmia and by, at 2.30 uh, a.m. in the morning, she passed out. So she, she couldn't get to where I was before this unfortunate event happened. The third case uh, was happened here in Port Harcourt. Uh, that was 2018, a 76-year-old uh, retired colleague of her, a very senior doctor who had um, who, who lived with diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Uh, she had STEMI, which presented with ventricular uh, tachycardias and cardiogenic shock. And uh, she kept having this recurrent VT over the night. And it was around 7 uh, p.m. that this event happened. But I happened to know about it around 10 p.m. in the night. I rushed to, uh, to the hospital uh, to see what we can do, uh, do to stabilize before we can move him to the cat lab. And over the night, we did not sleep. But uh, after episode of about eight episodes and on amiodarone and um, uh, uh, we have to combine amiodarone and, uh, and lidocaine, the patient has some relief before we took her to the cat lab and um, uh, it was a STEMI LED, mid LED total occlusion. Uh, we stented it and after that we have to put the patient on ICD for secondary prevention. So these are the three cases we have. Now, by definition of electrical storm, 
over the years, a number of things has happened to it. Uh, before now, we're talking about two episodes separated by an hour apart, but the most recent definition now talk about uh, three episodes in 24 hours or three separate episodes in 24 hours, three episodes in 24 hours. So that is what the guidelines talked about today. So electrical storm is a life threatening uh, arrhythmia that uh, that involve recurrent episode of ventricular arrhythmias. So it's defined as three or more sustained episode of ventricular tachycardia uh, or ventricular fibrillation or inappropriate um, implantable cardiovascular defibrillator shock that happened over a period of 24 hours. Now, the issue of uh, bringing ICD in is part of the recent definitions. Before now, we are talking about ventricular tachycardia ventricular fibrillation, but because of ICD, inappropriate ICD shocks that have now been part of the whole syndrome, so it has now been characterized as part of the definition. So most have underlying structural heart disease, but in some cases, you may not see any underlying structural heart disease. For example, this patient that we treated uh, had a dilated uh, chamber and the body, the, the coronary arteries are clean, so it's a non-ischemic uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, that is what she had. So the condition occurs in about 10 to 20% of patients with ICD, in, uh, ICD patient. So patients who have as, uh, experiencing M, acute MI as uh, the, I think the third case we presented, what happened there was just only MI. The only presentation she, he had is uh, constant uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia that you shock after a little while, it returned back. There was no other thing the, the man presented with. That was how he presented. Remember, it's an elderly, also diabetic, so autonomic features are, may have been blunted. And the only thing is that she say that I have, um, I have palpitation and he passed out. That was how the wife brought him to the hospital and we happened to know that this guy had an MI. So the incidence of electrical storm is however lower in patients who are placed on ICD for secondary prevention. The MODI 2 uh, sub, uh, uh, sub group or uh, sub study of 100, uh, 719 patients, 4.4% uh, uh, develop electrical storm over a range of 20 months. In another trial uh, uh, of another trial, 20% of those who receive ICD for secondary prevention experience electrical storm during a period of 31 months of follow-up. So intracardiac electrical, uh, electrocardiogram that we are recorded during uh, this episode showed that most were due to VT and occurs in about uh, nine months after the ICD implantation. So usually a specific trigger for electrical storm is not easily identified. In the shock as, uh, inhibitions of evaluation with uh, a zemilite, uh, the SHIELD study, the, the, the trigger for electrical storm was found only in 30% of the, uh, of the subject. Electrical storm can be precipitated by acute myocardial ischemia, electric, electric, um, electrolyte imbalance, Hypo, uh, hypokalemia, uh, hyperkalemia, um, hypomagnesemia, uh, worsening uh, heart failure, sepsis, or poor uh, compliance with antiarrhythmic uh, medications. Uh, the role of autonomic uh, uh, nervous system in triggering and maintaining uh, uh, electrical storm is, uh, is also well recognized. Hence, the sympathetic activation has been strongly advocated as part of the treatment for electrical storm. How do we classify electrical storm? We, uh, we classify based on the etiology, if it is, is it a monomorphic vent uh, ventricular tachycardia? For example, the patient that, the first patient we presented, presented with monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, that is the commonest form of electrical storm that we do see. If I had the second patient is also because they send the ECG to me on WhatsApp while I was talking with them. It's also monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. The third patient I also presented that, that uh, had a retired medical doctor. It's also 
a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So it's the commonest form of electrical uh, storm. The polymorphic ventricular tachycardia can uh, auto side the point is can also be a part or it can also be a presentation here of ventricular uh, fibrillation. So uh, in uh, ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, vulnerable substrates for re-entry lies within the heterogeneous area of the scar myocardium. And that is what generates the monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So after an MI or a non-ischemic uh, uh, cardiomyopathy progresses, the heart undergoes uh, structural changes, fibrosis, a lead to scar formation, which create area of conduction blocks. However, bundles of myo myofibrils can survive within this fibrosis, particularly around the borders of the scar. So slow conduction through this region provide a pathway for electrical reentry to, uh, to occur. Hence, uh, uh, a trigger can occur through there where a patient will now start having ventricular tachycardia. So monomorphic ventricular tachycardia can be asymptomatic or it can present as a patient in cardiac rest. For example, this first case we presented from CardioCare had a cardiac rest and it had multiple shocks. So the degree of hemodynamic compromise depends upon the, the heart rate the uh, left ventricular function, the, the presence of heart failure, or, uh, is, or the degree of asynchrony that this patient has. So is the patient on amiodarone beta blocker or uh, of, uh, pharma other pharmacological agent? It also depends on that. So another issue, again, that we also, uh, that also caused, as we said, is uh, the toside the point is. So uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia occurs when ventricular activation sequence on the surface uh, telemetry ECG consists of a biato beta uh, bit variation in the QRS uh, complexes. The polymorphic ventricular uh, tachycardia has frequently different mechanisms. So this is what a, uh, a, a toside the point is uh, looks like in patient that presents uh, either in ventricular storm or they have one episode of toside the point is. So ventricular fibrillation, yeah, uh, is another chaotic uh, rhythm that also can uh, uh, keep occurring and lead to electrical storm in patients. Now, uh, it happened, uh, the mortality among this group of patients is very high, almost 85 to 95 percent, except you have easy way of shocking them and re easy recognition and shocking them but in our environment where we don't have AED in all the uh, center, you go to a mall, you, uh, you go to a shopping center, there's no AED. But in the West, if you go to any shopping center or any market area or any public area, any company, you have all this AED and it's easy to recognize and uh, a patient can be uh, uh, defibrillated and while waiting for the ambulance to come. So what are the risk factors? Here we talked about coronary artery disease, uh, uh, QT prolongation. I think this our patient also had QT prolongation. Heart failure will reduce digestion fraction, uh, electrolyte imbalance. These are all part of risk factor. Things that we can also correct like hyper, uh, hyperthyroidism, uh, uh, fever, infection, Brugada syndrome, uh, prolonged QT interval, early reproduction syndrome, these are all part of the risk factor. Now, the presentation, the patient may just complain of palpitations, that I do have palpitations uh, because that is one of the key things that ventricular tachycardia present or dizziness or often syncope. And sometimes it may just present with uh, sudden cardiac arrest. The patient just pass out immediately. He may not even complain of anything. He just pass out immediately and he may be lifeless on the floor. So I see the patient complaining of several shock. You also think of uh, something of this nature. So the type of arrhythmia is very important. And as we said, monomorphic VT account for about 86 to 97% uh, of people with electrical storm. So the primary VF uh, may account for one to 21%. Miss, a patient may have miss of this uh, arrhythmia from ventricular fibrillation to ventricular tachycardia may miss up. You may see that really some people in about three to 14%. 
and uh, also polymorphic VT in about two to eight percent. So the key, key differential here is a Y complex uh, tachycardia. And if you see a patient with Y complex tachycardia, you are not sure of what exactly is that tachycardia. Treat the patients as a VT. Because if you don't treat the patients at a VT, the patient will pass out, will pass away. And if you treat the patients at a, as a VT and, and assuming the rhythm is not a VT, it's a supraventricular rhythm that is presenting with aberrancy, the, the treatment may also help that patient to survive. So these are the reasons why we say treat the patient and don't leave the patient. Treat as VT if you are not clear. So, the regular monomorphic, we have also listed that, listed that the one with regular tachycardia, monomorphic ventral tachycardia, superventral tachycardia with aberrancy, superventral tachycardia with bundle branch block, accessory pathway, atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter with bundle branch block. All this we present as Y complex tachycardia. The irregular ones, uh, yeah, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter with variable blocks. Then, then with um, uh, with uh, left bundle branch block, all of them we present with a uh, wide complex tachycardia that are irregular. So, effective treatment of electrical uh, storm require the knowledge of the arrhythmia mechanism, the therapeutic options, the ICD programming, and emergent techniques for refractory of these arrhythmias. So now, in the emergency, how do we address it? One is that it's a medical emergency and uh, initiate your, uh, your ACLS guideline immediately, uh, especially if the patient is uh, pulseless. Then if there is a need, you can sedate the patient and continue. So the management of electrical storm even It sounds like we might have lost Dr. Adafe in the call. Yeah, it seems so. Dr. Adafe. Okay. Dr. Adafe, so, can you hear us? I will message him, but um, while he reconnects, one point I'd like to make, and I think he's, you know, always make sure you're checking the patient's pulse. Don't necessarily trust a device has, uh, has shocked for, a, for the right reason. Not that they aren't typically right, but devices can also have uh, invalid shocks as well. So just because a patient reports shocks doesn't mean they were having VT or electrical storm necessarily. You always want to, to do some more digging on those aspects. Yeah, that is a, a very important point. In fact, in this case, um, after we put in the ICD, the patient reported and then put on IV and run on all the different drugs. Patient reported three more shocks and we were still quite confused. When we interrogated the device and other things, we didn't find any evidence of shocks. Um, all of that was not really there. So after what the patient had said, well, she was feeling a sensation or she felt just the trauma of the previous shocks that she was still feeling going on. So sometimes it's very good to also confirm and cross-check uh, what's what is happening so that you don't continue to escalate medications, Doctor Daffy? Welcome back. We lost you for a bit. Yeah, I'm back. Okay, so yes. go ahead. Okay, uh, AJ, you have to give me hosting. Oh, uh, let AJ, me... yes, because I've lost the hosting rights. Okay, mm, there you. So that go. I can share the slide back again. Okay, we got you, host. Yeah, you have made it. Yeah, same. Okay, so this is where I was when I left. So what I was saying, once you identify the patient, initiate, uh, if the patient has um, ACLS and is the electrical shock, you can get uh, electrophysiology consult and the uh, ECG morphology, know the type of ECG morphology, as we said, the commonest cause is monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, you can initiate your amyodarone beta blocker. We'll discuss the dosage shortly. Beta blocker, 
lidocaine, if you uh, if it's an ischemic uh, event that leads to it, yeah, lidocaine is is good and beneficial. Study have shown that sedation and other means can also be used for this group of patients. So identify rever reversible cause and treat them as much as possible. So for ICD management. Uh, we said that uh, patient with ICD who develops um, electrical um, uh, electrical storm often present with multiple ICD shocks, uh, like the second case I told you that happened 20, uh, 2019. Yeah, this uh, yeah 2019. That is the second case. So the lady had an ICD, but uh, from the event sent to me, it is not the ICD that is generating the shock. Rather, the lady has uh, uh, has a um, recurrent uh, VT that does not respond to any form of shock. That was what happened in that case. So this shock can be quite distressing. And when the patient keep having ICD shock from time to time, it is, um, is a real pathetic problem. And uh, the fear of another shock coming a look can even trigger the arrhythmia to continue its own uh, pathway. So. Uh, the management, as we saw in this case, uh, the patient was from ICU, the patient landed in the cat lab and back to ICU after the ICD and the angio. So these are all the pathway for management of electrical storm, uh, especially the antiarrhythmia, the, the ICD and uh, cat labs, EP and back to the cat lab. So the multiple ICD shock, if the problem is coming from the ICD, the first thing you look at is it a phantom, uh, uh, phantom uh, symptom or phantom shock? Phantom shock here means that uh, the patient just feel that the ICD is shocking, but it's not actually shocking anything. So jury assure the patient inappropriate shock is that the ICD is giving shock, and uh, and those shocks are not actually directed to the rearrangement. Really Maybe probably the sensing sensing of atrial fibrillation, supraventricular tachycardia. That is why the uh, the ICD is inappropriately shocking uh, the patient. So you have to you have to uh, reprogram the device. Sometimes you have to switch off that uh, uh, switch the uh, the the shock therapy off and uh, manage medically and reassure the patient. Get an EP consult and uh, take up with your electrophysiology to ensure that this patient re restore his ICD back again. So then for uh, for patients who require, uh, uh, who are in our setup in the sub-Saharan Africa, what I usually advise is the pharmacology, the pharmacology therapy will be the first approach here. Pharmacology therapy, the beta blocker are very key to the, to the management here. The beta blocker one is that there are sympathetic nervous system activations uh, and they decrease, they decrease that. And another thing is that another thing is that uh, uh, they uh, they also reduce anxiety that uh, occur after uh, multiple shocks occurring in them. So the drugs that have been uh, tried here are propanolol, uh, esmolol. They have been really, really tried uh, here, and uh, they have been found to be uh, very useful. Propanolol can be given at uh, 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 IV propanolol uh, 0 0.15 milligram per kg over 10 minutes, and you can give up to uh, 10 milligram. Uh, the issue here, I don't know of uh, Ghana and uh, Kenya, but here is that we don't have IV propanolol most time available within our coffer. So more of the propanolol that we have here are the, um, the oral propanolol, we have excess of it. So if you don't even have the IV, I was so advised that use the oral, can give 40 milligram every six hour until you ensure that that patient is out of uh, the electrical storm. Then uh, if you are using Esmolo, it's still the same thing. The, these oral beta blockers, are not very uh, available everywhere in Nigeria. So you have to source for them. You have to specifically request for them uh, to take them along. 
So, but if you have Esmolol, you can load 0.5 milligram per kg, use up to 30 milligram over one hour, over one hour. Then you maintain that. So beta blockers are very good. Um, uh, um, metoprolol, yeah, is also, if you don't have the other one, metoprolol can also be used. Amiodarone is, um, is a broad uh, a spectrum antiarrhythmia uh, arrhythmic agent. It works primarily via uh, class three activation. That is the potassium uh, uh, channel activation. It can also act as a class one. That is sodium channel blocking. Can also act as uh, class two, class uh, 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 four. That is the casual channel. It can also go through all those makes. So amiodarone has multiple ways of getting the work done. So amiodarone has been uh, shown in multiple trials uh, to reduce uh, the frequency of ventricular tachyarrhythmia and is very commonly used in electrical uh, storm. There are many studies uh, to that. I don't want to quote all the study, but this is one of the study in the optimal uh, pharmacological therapy in, um, in cardio, uh, cardiovascular defibrillator patient. The optic study, 412 patients with ICD were randomized to uh, 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 beta blocker, uh, uh, beta blocker plus amiodarone and sotolone. The, uh, the, the frequent uh, shocks occur in 7.4% of patients yeah, 7.4% of patients uh, in the beta blocker and 1.4% of patients with beta blocker and amiodarone. <clears throat> and 2.3% of patients on uh, sotolog monotherapy. So amiodarone is very effective. So we can use amiodarone, but the initial dosing of amiodarone, when you are using it, you should use it with uh, use it as an IV. You can, you can preload the patient with 150 to 300 milligram of amiodarone. You give it as a bolus push. Then after that, you put another, uh, maybe 600 to 900 on the, uh, on, uh, on infusion and run it for the next uh, 24 uh, hours. So until the, you are sure the patient is out, you, out of the VT, you can combine this amiodarone with, the, with another agent. Not that you wait for amiodarone to fail before you bring in another uh, agent. That is not the, uh, the, the tricks of managing it. The tricks is that if you think that combining two antiarrhythmic agents will give you a better yield, go ahead and do the combination. For those that have uh, Sotolol, Sotolol exact is uh, action through a combined class uh, class uh, three, that is potassium channel and class two beta blocker uh, action. Most of the clinical effect is uh, thought to be through its class three effect and leads to the prolongation uh, of repolarization and thus increases the refractoriness of the muscles. So this is where Sotolol comes in. If you have it, it's very good. Then as we said, lidocaine, lidocaine for ischemic uh, uh, heart disease and electrical storm, lidocaine is uh, very, very effective in doing that. And lidocaine uh, is, uh, is thought to be <clears throat> first line uh, compared to amiodarone if you are dealing with an ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy that is uh, leading to uh, the electrical storm. So, but you can also combine it to the issue here about lidocaine. Once you give it, it causes a prolonged refractory length of the muscles and keeps the, mus uh, the muscles from being, having that excessive uh, excitation from the, from the focal uh, point. But uh, it is effective when you use it with, uh, when you use it in uh, ischemic uh, events. So, uh, other things that you also think of here is uh, for people with uh, ventricular fibrillation, you can also, if you try the other method and it fail, you can also give them um, uh, magnesium sulfate, can also be an option. So the non-pharmacological therapy here for malignant arrhythmia uh, can also include uh, intra-aortic balloon pump or percutaneous left ventricular assist device. The reason here, but for all this, for example, uh, patients with uh, uh, patients will have a better uh, coronary perfusion pressures and dramatically reduce ischemic substrate for those that have ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, 
So we can do that. Then ablation is also uh, another thing. Catheter ablation is another thing that we can also use. Uh, but before now, prior to now, the teaching was that uh, rest the myocardium before you take the patient for catheter ablation. But a lot of technology has occurred and a lot of development has occurred. So this can be done on the table, even while the patient is having incessant uh, electrical storm. Then deep sedation is another issue here. The anesthetist can help us here because it's more of a multidisciplinary measure. Anesthetists can help us here to give a deep sedation uh, to the patient, and that also helps to drive to reduce the over uh, overdrive of the sympathetic uh, uh, action that trigger these arrhythmias. So intubation can be done, and uh, when intubation is done, you keep monitoring the patient on a monitor and continue your IV medication. So these are part of what the anesthetic do. Propofol can be used. Uh, Desmetidine can also be used. And you can also combine it with uh, the benzodiazepine. These are all that the anesthetists can give us. Uh, arterial line, yeah, can also be used to get uh, monitor the patient, get the blood gas uh, for the patients, and continue the therapy for the patient. So the key thing about uh, electrical storm is that if you identify uh, identify the cause. If you can identify the cause, treat the, the cause. For those that have reversible causes, like um, we talk about uh, in the third patient, that third patient had um, had um, a STEMI to a mid, a mid LED. That was what that patient had that triggered that electrical storm. And after the, uh, the, the, the restoration of revascularization, the patient did not have that electrical storm anymore, even though the patient was still on amiodarone for continual uh, monitoring. So uh, for those that have um, those that have electrical, sorry, electrolyte imbalance, ensure uh, that you correct the electrolyte for them. Those that are having fever, uh, hyperthyroidism, correct all that. And when that is done, those people tends to restore the myocardium from that hyperactivities. So these are things that we must do for those group of people. In the absence of any of such, an ICD is, uh, uh, should be planted in them. But the key is when you want to consider ICD in them, uh, for a patient who had electrical storm, ensure that that myocardium is, um, that myocardium is stable before you take the patient for an ICD implantation. Remember that the first case we discussed, it was a single shock we gave to that patient. As at that point, we can not characterize that patient as having electrical storm. That was why we took the patient to the cat lab. So it was in the cat lab, we're already in the procedure, in the midst, in the midst of the procedure. That was where we now seen, we started seeing things that we never thought of. So we're already in the midst of the procedure and we have just have to get it over. And that was why we did what we did. But for a patient who has multiple <clears throat> attack before the procedure, ensure that the patient optimal medical therapy is obtained and um, the patient myocardium is quieting for 24 to 48 hours before you take the patient into the cat lab. If not, you will still run into difficulty of positioning that lead into that right ventricle because immediately it touches the ventricle, it stimulates unusual arrhythmia uh, uh, for you. So other things that we can also use is uh, if they are valuable is the tag the basis of the stellar gangrene block. You can do that if every other thing fails. For example, the second patient that I, I presented, that was what I was thinking for that patient, but he did not get to us before the patient passed out. So the stellar gangrene block, the key thing here to do is just follow the, uh, the, the principle of approach. Now here is that you start a needle until that needle gets to the, uh, the uh, Shasanga, uh, Shasanga the tobacco. Dr. Once Francisca. it gets to the Shatnaga tobacco, you inject, um, you inject uh, uh, the the uh, you inject your can inject your lidocaine or inject 
um, uh, anti uh, your your medications on it. So once you inject on it, then you withdraw it to inject on it. The only difficulty in here is that that tobacco is at uh, is at uh, uh, the ceases is actually the extension of the ceases uh, tobacco, and um, you have the great vessels like the carotid artery, the uh, the carotid artery, the jugular veins, and also the uh, the vertebral artery, they transit through that area. So it is better that you use ultrasound, but if you don't have an ultrasound, the landmark to get it done is that palpate the trachea, the trachea at the point just beside the trachea, advance the needle down. If you don't have that, you are in a terrible condition, you don't have that, advance the needle down, and when the needle hit the tobacco, it stop. it cannot pass through because it's hitting a bone. So the next thing you will do is that aspirate back to ensure that there is no blood in that uh, in that needle. And after you have done, done that and it's on that bone, then you jet your medications on it. That terminates uh, the sympathetic supply to that region. The only thing here is that it can give you Horner syndrome. That those are the uh, major complications of um, of of these techniques. So you can see that other ultrasound it can be done and non ultrasound this is the landmark approach just beside the trachea you just at level of cc just go down beside the trachea avoid or the lateral approach you go behind the vessels that uh, the 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 veins and the artery that transverse uh, from the heart to the brain and you see here the same tobacco but ensure that you are not in any of these vessels when you do that so the best thing is to do it other ultrasound so that you have that entry into any of this uh, uh, vessel. So other things that can also be done for, a, for uh, apart from left ventricular assist device is that uh, you can also put the patient on uh, extracorporeal membranous oxygenation, that is ECMO. So why, why continue intubating the patient and assuring that uh, you restore quietness to the myocardium? Then stereotactic body radiation is also a therapy. We don't do all that here. So the prognosis is poor for a patient who keep having recurrent um, el electrical storm. So even the AV trial, five, patient, five patients with electrical storm have an increased risk of non-sudden uh, uh, non cardiac death occurring among them. Even the Moditus uh, subgroup also showed that they also have a high increased risk of 7.4% of dying from uh, suddenly. So a patient who has electrical storm must be followed closely and must be managed accordingly. And according more time, less, uh, sorry, um, more frequent OPD visit and check the medication and also uh, more frequent programming to see whether this patient is actually having uh, anti tachycardia pacing. Because if the patient is having anti tachycardia pacing in response to VT, you may not pick them up. And the patient may not even be aware of it. It's only when the shock is delivered that the patient be aware of it so that you can optimize your medication for them. So a patient who had a VT like this, our patient now, <clears throat> who had a VT uh, a month ago, if the patient come today and I ask the patient, have you ever had a, a shock? And the patient say no. That does not mean that the patient doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a VT. So you have to check the, uh, the ICD to see whether the patient had a VT and a shock, because the ICD will record it as a shock, but of a truth, what the ICD give is anti tachycardia pacing. So all these are things that help you to modify your medication, fortify your medication, to quiet that myocardium and avoid frequent shocking. Thank you very much. So time for questions. And thank you very much, Dr. Gaffe. Very yes, fantastic sir. presentation indeed. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, it's very important for us to note, uh, note it. This is not one of the cases that a cardiologist will sit down in the office or you know, just sit down and be telling the house officer what to do, add this, subtract that. This is one of the cases that calls for us to be on ground. So we don't have many emergencies that cause out of, out of our home in clinical cardiology. 
Um, but this is one of them that should get you seated in the, in the ICU uh, and then also following up with the patient to the cat lab. Thank you, Dr. Daphne, for that. We'll take any questions or experiences that we've had um, in, in these regards um, that will help us. My order is breaking. Are other people breaking? Amy, oh, can hi. You hear? Um, oh, nice to see, nice to see you, Doctor IJ. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so, Doctor Doctor, this was a great presentation. Hi, Doctor Zico. So, I just wanted to mention a few things just to reiterate um, what you were saying about VT Storm, because I think that it's important to. Um, you know, because you have ventricular tachycardia that a patient shows up with, they had an event, it happened, and that's it. VT storm or VF storm is a completely different beast. And like um, Dr. Seco said, that is, um, you know, an emergency and you need to be in the lab. There are a few things that I might change with regards to management of the patient. Um, First thing would be that when the patient comes in, has had more than two events in a 24 hour period, the patient gets IV amiodarone, no questions asked. And then you start doing all the other things. And of course, as you're getting the IV, I'm hoping that we're getting an EKG, we're getting a history from the patient um, because you, know, you do want to figure out what your etiology could be. Um, because of the fact that this, if somebody has VT or VF um, and has been shocked or has gone through CPR more than um, once in a 24 hour period, this is somebody who is telling you that they're really sick. And so you want to make sure that you are coming in front of whatever it is that they are presenting with. Um, so it's, it's very helpful when you have a cath lab or, you know, you're able to do a coronary angiogram um, really early in the hospital course because you don't know exactly what might be the cause. And like was shown in the case that was uh, presented today, um, if it's um, due to uh, acute event, um, then that's something that you could definitely take care of um, sooner rather than later. And so actually, um, you know, a lot of times, even though now previously it used to be seen that it was like an ST elevation equivalent. So if somebody came in with VF, um, then you would just take them straight to the cath lab. Now um, folks say, oh, give them amiodarone, let them quiet down, and then maybe take them a few hours later. So you do not have to take them immediately. You can take them, um, but within definitely within the first 48 hours, you would want to do that. Um, the second thing um, that I would mention um, is that, of course, the patient that has an ICD is very, the way you would treat a patient with an ICD is very different than the way you would treat a patient without an ICD. You know, the patient without an ICD, obviously, they haven't had, um, they haven't presented with this before, um, at least all things being equal. Let's say, you know, money is not a factor and, you know, they've seen a doctor before. They haven't presented with this before. And so you are allowed to be a little bit more esoteric with your differential diagnosis. So that's where the long QT, the Bugattas, the Hocum, you know, all of that stuff, in addition to the ischemic heart disease comes into play. An echocardiogram becomes really um, important as well as looking at the EKG for sort of subtle signs, looking at medication that they might be taking that might cause a prolonged QT, things like that. Um, then um, I think, oh yeah, the other things that I wanted to make mention of the sympathectomies and um, it's, it's a very difficult um, procedure to actually do. Um, and a lot of times is not as successful um, unless you have a lot of training um, in that area. So, you know, they say when they describe it, it makes it seem like, oh yeah, all you have to do is put your needle right here. You give some lidocaine and boom, it all ends. And actually that's not necessarily the case. Um, so what I would suggest would be IV amiodarone, giving lidocaine if you think that there's ischemic heart disease, but being very careful about your lidocaine levels, making sure that you are not 
um, giving them too much because then you could have neurotoxicity as a result. Um, the beta blocker is I could do or do without it, um, but um, making sure, and if the patient continues to have VF storm, then you should call your anesthetist and sedate them. And that will buy you time for you to figure out all the other things. And um, I think that's what I wanted to say. Oh, one last thing. If a patient has an ICD, when the patient comes to see you, always check the ICD, specifically because of what Dr. Edafi said. So, you know, the, the guidelines state that for patients who have an ICD, either they should be checked at home every three months, or if they're being checked in the clinic, they should be checked at least every six months. So there are patients that I see on a regular basis who nothing is going on with them, nothing is happening with them. I see them, you know, or I do a remote monitor, but I see them at least every six months just to make sure that they're not having those events that you were talking about where they have VT and they're being treated with painless therapy um, that we, the patient is not aware of because that will help you become more aggressive with your medical management. Um, and thank you. Thank you very much, Thank man. You, Dr. Very, Great. Yeah. <laughs> that was very insightful. Great. Uh, yeah. AJ, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, no. Thank you, Dr. Joma. Thank you, you know, uh, Dr. Dafe, Dr. Seko, for all of this. this has been amazing. Uh, one thing I, I want to mention is um, we kind of had this conversation the other day, Dr. Dafe, about um, considerations from an ethics perspective. So just remember that, you know, these can be very, as you mentioned, it can be very uh, painful, both mentally and physically for a patient to be shocked many times. So it should always be a consideration. And I think you should always, you know, make it clear to your patients when they're getting a device, the implications of having a defibrillator in them, because it could very well save their life, but it could also um, be very um, emotionally damaging to be shocked many, many times, um, hopefully for the right reasons. So I just, I just think, you know, we always want to make sure when we are speaking with our patients that they know that this is a possibility and that we are managing their care so it never becomes a reality. Uh, but ultimately, these do save lives, and many people are on this world because they had a device. So, yeah. I don't know if you want to respond to any of the comments or to add anything. If you have a question, please just put it in the chat box or raise up your hand and, and then uh, and then we can unmute you so you can speak. Okay, that's over to you. Okay, uh, very good. Um, the comment from uh, our electrophysiology, Dr. Joma, is very well noted. Um, uh, Dr. Joma, you know, one issue about this side is um, we don't have a remote monitoring process. So um, because of that, uh, once the patient leaves you, you don't have any access to that device. So you only have access to the device when the patient comes back to you and you put the, uh, the programmer, uh, you own the programmer and put uh, the programmer head on the device. So uh, that second case I talked about, that happened, the patient had, a, uh, had an ICD implanted, it was a very pathetic story. I discussed that case with uh, Dr. Murule and uh, uh, Dr. Ms. Ogundu. That was that 20, uh, a, a 2019. I was on call with them and I talk, so we talked at length over the case. Uh, the question is that what could have been done because Every medication that is available at, uh, to our disposal, the cardiologist at that end use it. Amiodaron, he use it. He also combine amiodaron with lidocaine. But the patient keep having recurrent shocks. I'm even checking whether the cardiologist is with us here, but I have not seen him today with us here. I, we keep talking and we did everything on the phone with him and there was no result. What could have been, what could have, what, what should have been done different? There was no magnet to put to disable the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the therapy. So what could have been done that we didn't do for that case? 
So I think anytime I think of it is always a nightmare. So I, I, I unfortunately, I didn't hear about the case. Um, so I'm, I, I'm going to be asking some questions, which you probably, you already discussed, but um, was the shock appropriate? Yes, the answer is yes, ma. That shock, okay. those shock were appropriate. Because so, I mean, why I say so? Is that the cardiology put the patient on a monitor and also once, once that device give a shock, uh, sorry, once, um, once the, the give, uh, give a shock, they also on the uh, surface EKG, also printing as uh, several of those EKG were printed uh, and it's clear that this patient is having monomorphic ventricular tachycardia in hemodynamic compromise. So if that is the case, and did they do a coronary angiogram? No, the thing happened, this event happened started 8 p.m. in the night, and the woman died 2.30 in the morning. It happened in a different city. So, so this is the, the thing, unfortunately. was to move the patient the following day. Yeah. Huh? So the, unfortunately, the only thing that you can do in that situation is to intervene, unfortunately. So, so intubate. this is the thing. To, yeah, to intubate the patient. Because what you're trying to do is quiet everything down because all that sympathetic tone is causing more VF. I suspect that the patient probably had ischemia. So there are two things that will cause you to have it like more and more. Number one would be ischemia. The second thing would be um, maybe CPVT, which is a specific type of ventricular tachycardia that is, um, I don't know how to pronounce this word, but it's like catho cathomimogenic. Basically, what it means is that the more catecholamine surge that you have, the more yeah, 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 have. yeah. And so every time you have a shock, it's actually going to increase a different, you know, increase it some more. So, you know, either one of those things could be the case, in which case um, intubating the patient would have been the only thing that would quiet things down. Because this is the thing, if you put a magnet on the patient, right, then the patient would have VF and not get shocked, but it doesn't really help you, right? Because then the patient would pass away. So um, oh. in that particular situation, I think that, you know, the only thing that you could do apart from figuring out the cause and, you know, trying to um, stop the VT, like the only thing you could do is stop the VT, which was, you know, give magnesium, give amiodarone, give, you know, them, intubate the patient, sedate the patient. Those are really the only things that you have in your arsenal. And if all of that is not, um, you know, successful, um, then unfortunately, um, this is where your hands are tied and you cannot do much else. More shots. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Seko, over to you, sir. Dr. Seko muted himself. You muted yourself, sir. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I don't know if there are any other people that have any questions uh, so that we can, um, you know, talk about that uh, briefly. Any questions so that we can easily just address them now. Or anybody that has anything to add? Maybe from, from experience. Dr. Maxwell, good to see you. Because when we have issues, we're going to call you in cardio care so that you can uh, intubate like your head. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Adasa, I don't know if you have any Dr. Apia. Dr. Apia is, uh, is, is with us. Apia from Kumasi. Oh, great. No, I don't, uh, but just that uh, um, I completely agree with uh, the drama that uh, that person may have had coronary artery. Is there is a coronary problem um, that needed attention. Uh, and unfortunately, maybe that person is not close to the environment where the event was happening. Yes. That was what happened, sir. The patient is in a different city and it takes four hours to get to where I was and it's happening in the night. So the aim was in the morning. The patient will move early in the morning, but unfortunately, the patient did survive the morning. 
I have what a question was, about the patient. What, what was when they you. sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I just wanted to know when they interrogated, did they interrogate the device at all? Oh, that is the biggest thing, Dr. Joma. Oh. The device was not, as I said, the device is St. Jude. Yeah. It was a St. Jude device. It was implanted yeah. in London. So they okay. returned the so woman I, went to her village. Yes. Yeah. I think that, you that know, it's one event. of those things where, yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, and this is something that, of course, it has to happen on a more policy-wide level, right? Where we have Nigerians who are going to different countries, getting devices, coming back home, or getting their devices implanted at home. We really need to talk about a network of physicians that have yes, you the are ability correct. to interrogate a device in every part of the country. So it cannot be that, oh, okay, Abuja, Lagos, and Potakot, and you know, maybe Kano are the only places. It has to be like, there have to be places that are identified along the country, similar to the way that we say, oh, AED should be everywhere. We should have a network of cardiologists interested in you know, interrogating devices um, and having the capability of interrogating devices so that we can talk to companies and basically tell them, hey, our patients in the country have your devices. We need at least 10 or 12 programmers around the country have people who have been demonstrated to, un to know how to interrogate devices so that this is not an issue. Good. For example, in the country now, Lagos, uh, Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, we can comfortably interrogate Medtronic and Abbott devices. Apart from these two devices, I don't know of any other device that we can interrogate in Nigeria because we have programmer for these two companies. So, as you raise up the same thing, uh, Dr. Merrill also raised when the event happened that time, 2019. He also said the same thing you just mentioned, that we need to talk to our people. But the question is that, you know that the people, they don't inform you before they move anywhere they are going to. And when they get to wherever they are going to, they don't ask them, who, we, how are you going to be managed when you get back home? So they just, it depends on the, you know, you know, you practice in the US. I've seen that in the, in some of these developed country, uh, it depends on if you, and if you go to a particular hospital, the hospital does more of Abbott devices. The other one does more of Medtronic. The other one does more of Boston and so on and so forth. This is how you guys repeat it among yourself. So it depends on where that patient enter. If the patient mm -hmm. enter into a place, where there is more of they just they just bring it and and throw the device at you they don't even consider whether you are going back to a remote place in africa where that device needs to be checked on so these are the issues maybe yeah, so Ogas, uh, dr Oga has something to say on it i think that um, ncs as a group will begin to advocate but as an individual cardio care has been trying to reach out to some of these companies to at least Put one of your programmers in the country because we've had an occasion to take out people's devices to exchange them to a more familiar device because, I mean, they'll just Correct. not tell anybody to do about it. So it's some of the things that we need to do both personally and uh, if there's a programmer at least somewhere in the country, most cities are accessible by flight within six to eight hours. Um, and with WhatsApp, a lot of telemedicine can happen. Um, Dr. Olga said that there's somebody that has sent you somewhere in Lagos. Yeah, I think I heard of that, but I think it's an old one. It's not able to interrogate all the newer devices. So I'm not so sure about that. So this network is not very clear and a lot of patients have devices in Nigeria, that's the truth. Some we have put and we know them, but they are, I think there are at least two times the number of patients that we have put that have devices from overseas. And we have to find a way to, you know, give them still support give them still the care that is needed for them. Uh, but for now, the main support we have in Nigeria is Medtronic uh, for device therapy, even training, and uh, all of that. So uh, that's what's happening. Um, I, I know that AJ has helped out and Peace for Life has really been of help to bring out. I think AJ wrote something in the, ch in the chat. 
Yeah, he said he's talked he's talked to somebody from Abbott and they should bring a couple of programmers from uh from Abbott next year. So that would be really fantastic for us to have. Um so we we'll look forward to that, AJ. So we'll have a lot a lot more programmers in the country. And with the Pace for Life program, we actually have a lot more patients benefiting from these devices. I foresee a, a situation whereby with the increased number of cat labs, with the increased number of operators, uh with the with the increasing general state of health in Nigeria, that in the next five years we'll have quite a proportion of a population of patients with devices, and that could be catastrophic if there is no capability to manage them. Um, as of now, very few people are able to interrogate and do all of that. So that's quite important. If you look on your screen, I've put a short summary. But I don't know if this um, encompasses. Uh, most of what we've talked about. So something that you can take home. Yes, just screen that grab is it. fine. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Lambert. Uh, so he says in Ghana, they have a similar situation um, that patients get imp implanted abroad and they have, and you know, when they have issues, they're handicapped there in Ghana as well. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Lambert for, for sharing with us. So this, uh, this is an African issue, really. It's an African problem, really. And it's something that, we must find a collective solution too. I really will hope that Where, someday uh, somebody yeah. will, will come up with a, with a universal programmer. I will really hope, hope that that will happen someday. Um, let yeah. me just give a, a short summary based on what Dr. Daffy has presented for those that joined us late. Um, if you look on your screen, you will see a short one page, page uh, like an SOP that you can just put up somewhere. Three or more sustained episodes within 24 hours of VTVF or appropriate just on an ICD. But of course, for our environment, don't wait till it gets to three or more. Once you have one, you should begin to have that idea. Once you get to the second time, begin to think of it like a VT storm or an electrical storm. The typical etiologies are structural heart disease, a acute MI, inherited ar arrhythmic syndromes. If the patients we presented, they had structural heart, one person had structural heart disease, the most recent patient, and the other one, one had um, acute MI, another had an ICD in situ already for which you suspect they may have been an ischemic event. And of course, you must remember that electrolyte derangements, a new STEMI, sepsis, worsening heart failure, ICD dysfunction could all be precipitant in this. Um, it, there's a very poor outcome, a very poor outcome and must as an emergency. Um, you need to do a 12 lead EKG, echo, troponins, electrolyte panel, thyroid panel, and uh, ICD interrogation is important if the patient has an ICD, but uh, Dr. IJ added, it's important that you interrogate the patients regularly so that patients that do not have shocks, you are able to uh, make sure that you have um, some kind of um, input and know when things are already going bad before they come up, come down with multiple shocks. Most of the treatment centers around IV are milled around and that Dr. Edafa said in our environment, if you're unable to um, differentiate clearly between two, of uh, them consider giving amiodarone, you can't go wrong most times amiodarone. Now, I know that IV amiodarone is not available in every part of Nigeria. And uh, in the case of Dr. Edafet discussed, I don't know if IV amiodarone was available or oral. Uh, for a large time, uh, when I trained in the Southwest, it was mainly high dose oral we were given. We did not have IV amiodarone, but IV amiodarone is now available. IV lidocaine, which is preferred in MI, can be used and do not hesitate to combine. You know, uh, but remember to check for levels if you have the ability, or you can and, and then look out for neurotoxicity. Beta blockers and propanolol is quite particularly useful in addition, just quieting down adrenaline discharge. Um, electrophysiology studies, if available, unfortunately, there's none available on a continuous basis in Nigeria at the moment, to my knowledge. Um, and then other treatments patients that have had an MI need revascularization to help. Uh, in the patient that were presented, we, while we we're having the multiple shocks, um, we did the uh, the angio as well. After putting the ICD, we, put, we did the angio as well, which was clean. And uh, treat any precipitant that is there. Sympatectomy was described by Dr. Edafe as relatively looks straightforward, but as Dr. Ibi rightly pointed out, it looks straightforward, but it's not as straightforward as it looks. It could be um, difficult. ICK is critical. <laughs> Once you're quieting down the place, wait for 24 hours or thereabout, let the myocardium quieting down before you go to put an ICD, but consider 24, 48 hours. And then sometimes patients will need circulatory support, IABP, um, sedation, and or intubation. You're just quieting down everything. And this is why you need a multidisciplinary team to help 
in the management. As um, AJ told us, remember psychotherapy and detailed counseling. These patients need to know that, yes, it's a life-saving treatment, life -saving treatment, but the um, the trauma of having shocks can be quite significant in their quality of life overall. And there are quite a number of people to talk about quality of life in patients with ICDs. And it's important to look at all of this together. I think this summarizes largely what we have said so far. Um, Dr. Oga suggests that we we'll repeat this topic at an LCS meeting. Uh, we we'll definitely will look forward to it. Once we get the opportunity, we are ready. Um, anytime patients send, anytime people send patients for ICDs or, first of all, I prefer patients do not, I mean, doctors in Nigeria do not send patients abroad. We have centers in Nigeria, in Lagos, multiple in Lagos, in Abuja, that can do these procedures. It's very important for cross, you know, we can talk together, we can improve the skill together, we can interrogate together. When you have an issue, it's, it's easier when for a patient you have seen that for a patient you don't know from, you know, from anywhere um, to start, it can be quite challenging. But if you have to send them abroad for whatever reason, including the patient's choice or preference, um, please make sure that you include the kind of devices for which you have. And for now, largely Abbott, thanks to Pace for Life, who has been quite supportive, and, um, you know, Medtronic, who are, who are almost fully on ground. It's quite important to note those ones. Um, and finally, it is important to note that I think that any, any practice that is represented here should make sure that they have a functional um, defibrillator, not just an AED, but a full manual one that can also um, do what is necessary in the case of an emergency. Because when this thing is happening, you don't have that time. You don't want to be pressing the thing and let it be analyzing, analyzing, you know, and have that time. That time could be quite difficult and could be a problem. So make sure that you have a functional defibrillator in your units. Um, as we do that, um, there is some support from Pace for Life for those that absolutely need it and in dire need. But apart from that, most hospitals in Nigeria can afford it, a defibrillator once they consider it a significant thing. And that is our job not just to give patients treatment, but to advocate that the milieu for better treatment is available um, all around. So thank you very much. If there are, I will, if there are any other yeah. issues, we'll go. Dr. Seko, uh, before you go, there is a question and I said, please, into, uh, after intubation, do we still continue amiodarone? The answer is yes. It's an, intubation is an added therapy. So the amiodarone is typically given as an IV bolus dose and you continue to infusion, typically for us 24 to 48 hours, and then we transition to aura. Um, mm -hmm. And then in the case of um, a VT storm, electrical storm, you may want to add IV lidocaine. The normal lidocaine people use to anesthetize wounds, most times will still serve. Look at the dose, look at the percentage, and then recalculate it. Um, of course, it is a critical drug so make sure that you do um, cross-checking with a second party. When you calculate your dose, speak out what you have calculated and how you arrived at it and let somebody else cross-check it. So don't say at the all in all, somebody cross-checks and then you might want to add a lidocaine as well. So that would be helpful. Um, if you do not have IV amiodarone, of course, everybody has lidocaine. So if you don't have IV amiodarone, you can start your lidocaine and then occasionally we've tried um, in the past, before uh, before we use oral um, while giving the IV uh, lidocaine, and it has been um, quite uh, helpful, to, if I must say. So rather than give nothing and say there's nothing, and then be assured that you can reach out to anybody on the group. Um, Dr. IG has been fantastic and giving and giving great support to us here in Nigeria. Um, AJ and a lot of the members of Pace for Life are not just helping, they're actually passionate about helping. You can reach out to Dr. Edafe, you can reach out to me, and we can easily advise uh, wherever you are to a large extent. Okay, AJ, I'll hand over to you now. I think my job is done. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Sega. That was awesome. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so I don't know how much time everyone has, but we can quickly, let me take back host here. Um, go through the quiz. Has anyone had a chance to look at it yet? At all? If not, we'll go through it now.
Can everyone see my screen here? Yes, mate, we got it. Perfect. Okay. So uh, once again, these are Abbott focus quizzes because the gentleman who produced these and gave them to me works for Abbott. So um, it will hopefully get some Medtronic material as well down the road. But for now, um, we'll go ahead and get started here. So does anyone want to take a shot at this first question? The red shock button on the Abbott programmers. So you have a VVI button, which puts it into emergency VVI, and then you have the red shock button. Will it instantly shock the patient when you press it? Anyone want to take a stab at it? I'm going to go with no. I'm going to, I think it's, uh, then you need a confirmation to go ahead and uh, determine whether you're going to deliver the shock or not, because given the location of the button, you don't want to accidentally lean on it perhaps. So there is definitely a second step before it delivers a shock would be my understanding. Yep, exactly. Thanks, Jared, for that. Uh, yeah, no, that's exactly the point. Um, when I first saw these, when I first started working for Abbott, I was terrified of this button, but there are extra steps involved. So I have used this a number of times, um, not really much in an emergency setting, maybe once or twice, but more um, if we decide to cardiovert a patient. Some physicians like to cardiovert with the device. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend it because it can kind of use the device's battery more than it needs to. Um, but it is a possibility. So if you ever do need to shock a, a rhythm, you press the red button, you'll get this pop-up here that asks you how much energy you'd like to deliver. You can then customize the energy and then deliver the shock. You will still see the capacitor charge across the screen like you see with the normal uh, Abbott device where you see those asterisks as the capacitor charges and then a timed shock will be delivered. So, all right. How about this one? This is a CRT question. Um, so first question, what view are we currently in? We've kind of blocked it off here for you. So you're going to have to figure it out on your own, but there's a couple of good landmarks that are good clues. And then the second question, the second question uh, which branch are we in? Branch. LAO. Okay. Is this an LAO? So no, um, this this is not an LEO that is exactly. It looks like an yes. LEO view. Yeah. So this oh, one will be this is this is uh, AP. and that branch looks like posterior lateral. Okay. Uh yes, so posterior lateral on that branch. The view is actually that's RAO. The lateral. Yeah. So the view, so we'll answer the first question here. The view is actually an RAO. So normally you'd obviously be able to see it here. Your big clues that you're an RAO right now is the uh, orientation of the spine. So in AP, you would be sitting a, a kind of across the spine. Um, in LAO, you would see generally, because um, you'd be looking down the barrel of the heart, you would see the right ventricular lead uh, to the left of the spine. And then you'd see the CS lead crossing the spine. Um, indicating that you are in LAO. So this is an RAO, so we're looking down the long axis of the heart. Um, so the heart is actually extended out to here. Another really good um, you know, indicator here is if the patient, I don't know how many patients you see like this, but if they've had previous cardiothoracic surgery, they they have these um, these wires here where they've yeah, wired bypass. the chest back together. Yeah, exactly. So in AP, the wires would be sitting over the spine. And in LAO, the wires would be to the left of the spine. So this is your RAO view. Um, RAO is really good to you know look at the heart in the long axis, but it's really, it's harder to tell the placement of the LV lead as far as, is it posterior? Um, is it going more anterior? Things like that. So um, to answer your question, yes, you, you had it completely right that this is a posterior lateral so it would be this vein right here, most likely. It could be a little higher, but I'd say most likely it's the posterior lateral or a lateral vein. I wish we had the LAO view here, but if you look at it here in RAO, the takeoff to the CS is here. We're looking down the barrel. So when you're in RAO view, you're actually looking directly into the os, the CS os right there, the entrance to the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus then goes down and then more posterior towards the back of the heart comes out and around. So remember that the more you follow the, series, the CS, the more anterior or lateral the structure will be. So your middle mm -hmm. cardiac vein will be kind of uh, right there in the septum, but then you'll start to move more of your posterior, your posterior lateral, your lateral, 
And then if you go all the way around, you know, you'll end up in the AIV, which is becoming not only um, anterior, but it's also, I mean, not only is it going to be on the septum, but it'll go more anterior as well. Um, <laughs> general, sorry. In, in, in this view, is this mm -hmm. a, is this view for this schematic? Is this an LA or an RAO view in this schematic view? So this is, an, this is an RAO view. Yeah, so we're looking down okay. the long axis. This is the same as this one here. Um, obviously, is this is not every heart looks like this, but generally they're a lot bigger and more dilated um, than even this. But we're looking, we have our spine here to the left. If we had our RV lead, it would be across the spine. Our orientation, our ribs are pointing downwards this angle. So we know that with the spine this far to the left, we're looking RAO we're looking down the long axis of the heart. If we were AP, the spine would be more across the heart itself. And then in LAO, um, the spine would be even more to the uh, to the right side of the heart. So right now we're looking RAO, we're looking into the entrance of the os, and your CS is gonna take this natural kind of check mark shape. Um, and then once again, the deeper you go in the CS, the farther along you go, the more anterior you get. So you don't always wanna take the deepest, are the farthest option because, oh, you might say, oh, I'm really far in there. I have good stability, but most likely you're going to be more apical than you want to be. You're going to be more anterior than you want to be. So you're not really having good engagement of the tissue electrically. Any other questions there? Hey, AJ. Yes, sir. AJ. Yeah. So if you are to select, if you are left to select between the, between these two, veins mm -hmm. which one would you like to select because if you left with me i will go for the one before that is i will the go for the posterior lateral this one here mm -hmm. the green one or the purple one or the purple no the purple yeah that's yeah. what i think so. i so the once we prefer yeah. the purple the reason why i said so mm -hmm. is that uh one your CS sheet has to sit a little inside so that it doesn't fall out easily mm -hmm. when you are pushing in your, your leads. Mm -hmm. So right. I would prefer this, uh, that purple one, Dr. Seko. Okay. So, but, the thing is, though, but the thing is though, sometimes you're, I mean, if you're spoiled for choice, then yeah. <laughs> but most of the time you don't really <laughs> have a Jonah. choice. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time you don't have a choice. It's like you see one one vein that the lead can go in and then you see a spidely vein. Mm. You see one that has like a corkscrew that you can't quite enter. Yeah. So yeah, so if you're lucky enough to say, oh, should I go for this one or you should go for this one, then thank you, lucky stars, and just go for the first one that you can enter into. <laughs> this is what I would say. <laughs> okay. But um, one thing that I like doing double, if it would take me to do uh, double slitting. I prefer it than. What do you think, Ma? Double slitting for? Oh, you mean putting an inner catheter? Yes, for you to. If oh, most of the vein I, around here. Uh huh. Most of the vein. An inner catheter here, is my. Inner catheter is my main go-to. Like I, I, I always oh, carry nice. an inner catheter with me. I, it's actually quite. I think it's it's. It's rare that I'm just kind of going in and um, just going straight for the vein. Usually, because, exactly. because of the way the veins come out, um, usually yes. you end up having to use an inner catheter because of that 90 degree angle, just so that you can kind of get in there. Now, sometimes you have, mm. you know, things go the way that they're supposed to go and you have a nice canted lead and it catches the tip of the vein and you're able to go through, which is great, mm. um, but that's less likely. So I think that, you know, at, at the end of the day, you want one that is the most lateral, posterior lateral or lateral, um, with the idea that the most lateral part of the heart will have the latest activation. So by pacing right. it, then you're able to improve cardiac synchrony. Because the idea behind all of this is that you're trying to improve cardiac synchrony. And synchrony. the best way to do that is by getting the most lateral. So the purple one, you know, it's a lateral mm. vein, yes, but it might end up being, depending on where the tail goes, it might end up being a little <laughs> bit more anterior. 
than not. And so, you know, you just kind of have to um, work things through. There are some times that you have that, you know, middle cardiac vein that ends up having a lateral branch and that's the one you Correct. end up taking. So it's, it's there's, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat in this sort to, of situation. To go about you just, it. Exactly. Right. Thank you. AJ, continue. Perfect. No, I, I think that's, yeah, sometimes the, the best vein is the one that you can actually get in. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Joma, so do you typically you use an inner, do you use an AL2 or a CSL for cannulation, or do you just like to use like a 90 or an acute for um, subselecting? How, how do you typically use your inners? So, um, I am a creature of habit. I do the same thing all the time. So, I put the AL2 in the outer. I use the AL2 to cannulate the CS. We, you know, use a woolly wire, go up in, go with the outer over the CS wire, take my AL2 out, and then shoot with, you know, die, maybe, die in a balloon, figure out my branch. And if I'm going to use an inner, then I will go with the woolly, with the inner back up again, and then I will cannulate with that. Okay, and you just kind of pick the inner based on the on the need, the the angle. The exactly, inner, okay. exactly, based off of that. So if it's something, if it's something that I have to use, like I end up using a ninety, I end up using the higher degree most of the time okay. in my thirties, because oh. what ends up happening is that the ninety degree, it, it I want the hook. <laughs> so basically, what ends up happening is with the one thirty, it's so mm -hmm. close that by the time it gets in, it actually hooks onto the os of the vein and mm. you know i'm able to um cannulate that really well the 90s end up straightening out after a little while and they end up being like a 45 which doesn't really help me but um yeah so uh just a i will go a deeper discussion um into crt and subselection i, I won't we're gonna get some people who are actually you know skilled like dr joma or uh, dr sharif to talk about this but uh, the al2 she was speaking about is going to be an intercatheter that kind of has a shepherd's crook to it and it's good to kind of point you in the cs it'll kind of cup the bottom of the atrium and hopefully aim you towards the cs so you're able to get the right angle of approach and um, get access to the CS itself. Later on, when she's talking about using a uh, 130 or what an Abbott would call an acute, um, there's also the 90 option. Typically in the body, it's more rounded than this. The 130 becomes a 90 and the 90 becomes an obtuse and the obtuse is basically straight because you just have all of this force, this pressure of the lead itself and the vein pushing back. But what she's using is running the larger catheter in and then using this more acute turn to get access to these veins. Um, one thing is we're looking at this in a very two-dimensional model. So it's always good to look at this in LAO as well, because while this looks like it could be a relatively clean takeoff, it could be much more torturous. We just don't see it in this, this uh, RAO view. Um, so make sure that you're checking your, your views. And um, you know, there's always options of if you're going for a more um, this one here, say, for example, you go for um, this vein, it's very long. And if you manage to get all the way down here, just remember the closer to the apex uh, data shows the outcomes aren't quite as good. So you're wanting to go more basal location. Um, so you may, if you have the ability to pick a lead with wider electrode spacing, for example, um, St. Jude has a 60 millimeter spacing from tip to prox, which could get you more basal with your uh, later electrodes. But if you use that one here, it's going to be useless because half of the electrodes are going to be sitting here. So it's uh, just things to consider when you're using your product here. Let me get back to my mouse. Okay. How do I clear this? All right. Um, so this last question, I thought this one's actually pretty fun and it actually ties back to our conversation that we had last week that, uh, that some of y'all may have been on the call for. So <clears throat> they went ahead and we'll go ahead and just use this example here. Um, using the fluoro image from before, they came in and they did electrical testing. Um, so with Abbott devices, I couldn't tell you about Medtronic, but there's an ability to determine the site of latest activation. And the way they do that is you actually, you pace on the RV and then you sense how long it takes for that electrical pace to be sensed or the electrical, um, you know, uh, depolarization to be sensed on the left ventricular lead. And that can give you an idea of how wide your electrical spacing or how long it takes for the electrical pace to move from the right ventricular lead to make its way all the way through the myocardium 
to the left uh, ventricular lead. So they went ahead and did some testing. Here are the numbers here. So some really interesting things to point out when you look at P4, P4 to CAN, um, that's going to be your unipolar. And then you have P4 to ring. As I said last week, I always avoid going to, to RV ring, not coil. RV coil is fine, but RV ring on a, um, on a pacing lead is very small and you have the risk of anodal stem. Um, but you have a high threshold here, and then you have P4 to M2. Remember, we talked last week that there is a chance that you could have um, you could have anodal stem within the lead itself. So that's a, a consideration. Why is this one so much lower than the other thresholds here? Well, it could very well be that we're actually not capturing at the fourth electrode, which would be this guy up here. We're actually capturing at the second electrode because the pace is moving from here to here and due to an odal stem, we're getting a more um, apical capture. Um, whether or not that's a bad thing, that, that's to be determined based on the orientation of the lead and what options we have, but generally you don't want to anodally capture. So really quick, the questions here before test results, um, let's see, what would you say is the optimal cathode for programming? Um, and then based on the actual thresholds, uh, what would you choose as your final threshold or your final vector. So just initially, what do you think is the best one to choose out of these? If we ran a um, an electrical activation test, anybody want to take a shot at it? I mean, initially you want to think, uh, as you just mentioned there, AJ, you want to, you're thinking you want to be basal. So straight away, you're thinking maybe P4, M3. Um, they've obviously got the longest uh, QLV time. So mm -hmm. that's all in favor of that as well. So yeah, my initial would be the prox four, then maybe the mid three. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. So both from physical orientation and then, so it's this is kind of a surrogate of QLV. I, I love that you mentioned QLV. Um, this is not truly a QLV test, but to your point, it is a surrogate of a QLV test. Sure. So it does yeah. its best to replicate it. Um, and QLV is obviously a gold standard that you that many people will run. So um, I'm sure we can talk you through that at some point if we ever need to run one um, with a patient. But exactly. So we have the more basal location um, and then also the greatest electrical distance. So not only greatest physical distance, possibly, but also electrical distance between um, between the two. So, um, yeah, I would say P4. But then looking at the thresholds, P4 is not ideal. Um, so anyone want to take a shot, Jared, feel free, uh, what you would pick as your final vector. I know there's a lot here, so, um, you can maybe just say what your, what your final cathode would be. Sure. Um, I mean, naturally you want to think either anything with the lowest threshold, but sometimes the lowest threshold doesn't necessarily mean the best capture. Mm -hmm. Um, Because obviously distal tips quite could be quite apical. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, we got a. I'm just trying to look through them. Yeah, I mean you got a mid uh, a mid two to mid four. Again, that's using. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, I mean, initially I'm thinking prox four to mid two. I know it's one point seven five, and you probably think, well, that's a bolt higher, but. Usually with LV leads, personally, you don't always have to uh, program the double double the output. So you could probably mm -hmm. get away with maybe a two and a half threshold there uh, if this was a chronic lead. But it's obviously an acute uh, lead because it's just been implanted. But mm -hmm. yeah, plenty going through my mind. I, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, no, uh, yeah, it's it's a lot. So I, I will tell you here. Um, so four to two, um, based on the fact that your unipolar vector is so mm -hmm. much worse than your bipole, this indicates to me that this is actually anodal stem. So. Oh, sure. It's okay because we're capturing. We a way to prove this would be to use a surface EKG and pace from M2, um, mm -hmm. and see if the M2 pacing and also on your EGMs morphologically looks the same as your four to two, right? Um, because that's a strong indicator then where you're actually evoking any kind of response. You could mm -hmm. be capturing it both, but considering the threshold is so high, I would say this is anodal capture. Um, gotcha. And once again, it's not a bad thing because two is actually our best option, I would say as well. And that's, a, this is what the person who wrote this agreed um, to is probably our best option, but yeah, the threshold yeah. is just higher. And if you want to avoid, you want to try to 
paste from the cathode if you can. So yeah, Definitely. two to four is what they recommended here. I would never use two to ring. Uh, once again, you have anal stem possibilities. You could be tricked and thinking you're capturing and you're really capturing in the RV, um, not even capturing in the LV and you're pacing this patient into heart failure. So I would avoid the ring like a plague and go to either can or if it's a defibrillator going to coil. Um, two to four is fine. You can also go two to whatever other options are maybe available um, as well. But yeah, so here, I'll just hold this here so you're able to, to read it. But no, uh, um, that would be the best situation, I would say. And then obviously D1, as you mentioned, is is getting pretty apical. And data shows that, you know, apical locations is one of the worst places you could be. So um, feel free as an EP um, if you want to jump in somebody, because once again, we're not electrophysiologists. We're just here to help. So. I also wanted to mention that the other thing that I look at, mm -hmm. you know, having a QLV is great. Um, and the second thing that I look at is actually, even though the papers say that, well, your final QRS doesn't do anything, I honestly don't believe that. I think that mm -hmm. the data that we have is old and nobody's going to do a randomized trial now. Um, but I, I truly suspect that improvement in your regular EKG actually will pretend a better outcome for you. So anyone that gives me the nicest EKG, that's the one mm. that I will take as well. So there are a few things, right? You don't want your battery to die too early. So you're looking for a good threshold. But if let's say I had one who had a threshold of 1.75 at 0 0.5, which is not bad, by the way, but the mm -hmm. EKG looks so good. Like the QRS is like 90. Oh my goodness, I'm taking that. Yeah. No questions asked. So. W one thing I, before I forget, one thing I forgot to mention, there's no impedance listed here. Impedance also has a massive impact, right? So four to can or two to can, for example, could have a much lower impedance, which could actually make a bigger impact on Difference. your drain. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then, yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of good papers, uh, Truco, um, I think they're out of Italy, Truco et al. And I'm trying to think who else. Um, uh, so some good papers on QRS, um, like fusion optimized intervals in QRSs. So how narrow your QRS is um, and association with better outcomes. And I think that we're going to start seeing out of like Abbott and out of Medtronic as they get these adaptive, so uh, Sync AV in uh, Abbott and Adapt-A in Medtronic are these adaptive algorithms that work to kind of get as much fusion between the intrinsic conduction, the RV pace, and the LV pace to, um, to gather as much tissue as possible and get the narrowest QRS. Um, so you'd be pacing from here, you'd have the intrinsic working its way down, and you'd be pacing from the LV, and you'd try to engage as much tissue as possible. I think that would kind of like hold up to what you're arguing is, right, is trying to get the most pretty QRS you can, the narrowest QRS. Now, whether or not LV activation versus narrow QRS, I think that's, um, you know, I'm not, I haven't done these studies, I'm not an EP, but I think that I've heard a lot of debate between EPs and about whether or not they want to have more LV activation versus the most narrow QRS possible. But the data shows in general, you know, a pretty QRS is associated with good outcomes. Uh, I don't know your thoughts on that though, Dr. Jones. Oh, I agree. I mean, with the latter part, the LV, the um, QLV, I think, I think honestly, at the end of the day, um, of the more modern studies that have been done, mm -hmm. the only thing that really showed improvement or really showed um, improved or predicted your response to, um, to a better outcome was really what the what you had in the beginning which was you know when they looked at echoes showing dyssynchrony when they looked at all of that stuff if your qrs was narrow and you went in and did a by v even if the echo showed dyssynchrony right or didn't really show improvement but if you had somebody who had a problem with their qrs and so left bundle or a severe like non-left bundle and you somehow improved that then that um, promoted or that showed that the patients actually did better post, um, you know, by the placement. So mm -hmm. I think that the EKG, um, you know, does more and it's, it, it's actually, it might be after all this 
technological stuff at the end of it, if we come down to the EKG, the EKG is what's going to show, you know, better improvement. And I have seen patients who, you know, they start off and they are, you know, I have patients who they start off and they have a left bundle and I give them medication and I optimize them and their QRS improves by itself. And then I check mm. an echo and their EF has improved. Mm -hmm. And then there was this, there's this one particular guy who, you know, I told, and the reason why I bring him up is because I told him that his EF has improved. He doesn't need an ICD anymore. He got so happy that he had a bunch of celebratory drinks. Um, and um, I guess his cardiomyopathy was um, as a result of alcohol use. And he came back three months later and his QRS was back to being in left bundle. And I checked his echo and his echo was back to being 30, 35%. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, if you have situation, and I'm not the only person that this has happened to, you know, because I was going to write a paper on it and then I realized now this is a common phenomenon. <laughs> but <laughs> it does go to show you that, hey, this is actually a thing. And, you know, whereas not all left bundles have cardiomyopathy, um, if you have a cardiomyopathy and a left bundle and you get rid of the left bundle, typically those patients will do better with regards to their EF. Sorry, I was just, I was repeating that in my head. Okay. Can I, um, yeah. can I ask a question? Just AJ and Dr. Kuru probably jump in as well, just on the medical side. But do you guys in the US use uh, imaging like MR to help you guide uh, LV placement or CS lead placement? Because especially in patients maybe with ischemic cardiomyopathy, looking at tissue viability and making sure that you're actually putting the lead in a place where you're going to generally catch uh, viable tissue. Is there any evidence for that? Um, no, and I don't know if there's no, um, at least for us, it's just an added, I typically will do uh, MRI for patients who have non-ischemic um, cardiomyopathy to figure out diagnosis, but um, there isn't really any evidence for any imaging to be done prior to. And then unfortunately though, it goes to show you that, you know, sometimes you put it in, you see a lovely vein, and you put it in and the thresholds are like, you don't even have capture at 10. So that tells you that, you know what, you're in an area of scar and there's nothing really yeah. you can do about it, Yeah, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah that does happen for sure. I think, I think at Wash U, we have used MRI before. Um, this is back in St. Louis, but it was already done. And it's kind of like when you do, when you have it for like a VT or something, it's like a good reference, mm -hmm. but I don't think they ever did it um on their own for, like, they just had it and they used it so yeah no no it's certainly it's certainly not used here in the uk as as, as gold standard but not at all but uh it was just something i've always queried whether you know you spend hours and hours sometimes trying to get an lv lead placement and you yeah. put it down and you get there and you go oh we've got no capture at eight bolts and like, oh. <laughs> but maybe if you were driven a little bit more by some imaging techniques that maybe you go right this is the area of this is where the area we've got to target and, and just make maybe make planning the procedure a little bit better. But, uh, but yeah. again, that's cost. It's, I, it's, it's, it's not cheap to do that. And it's, it's quite time, time, not time effective either. And I think it's also one of those things where, you know, the vast majority of patients, you don't need to do that. So to do that yeah, for yeah. that 2% of patients that it would be a benefit for is not necessary. No, and I, I think exactly. that that's the yeah. reason why it's not recommended. Cool. Thank yeah. you. So I'm, as imaging gets better and cheaper, I mean, that could very well be a viable option too. Um, but yeah. Perfect. I am posting the answers for today's quiz in the group. So if you uh, have any questions, feel free to reference that, reach out to us. Um, does anyone have anything else? I know we've taken up uh, almost two hours of your time. So we appreciate everybody hopping on and listen to us chat. That's been great, mate. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Daffy. And yeah, thank, yeah you thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Daphne, Dr. Dr. Oh, yes, thank you, everyone. Yes, yes, yes. AJ, enjoy. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank Good you, night. Thank you, Dr. Kiro. Appreciate it. Dr. Jamal, thank you very much. Thank you.